right, good morning. Let me ask you to stand real quick. No, real quick. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and let's um, maybe bring the mic down just a little. It got a little echo in it. And um, let's pray. Lord, as we open your word, I pray you help each of us individually and as a church body to open our heart to hear from you and to respond to you. And Lord, that you just continue the work you've begun in us. We do pray for safety during this storm for the state of Florida. Give us wisdom and guidance and direction individually and as a, and Lord, as a state and how to respond to one another in the midst of it. So Lord, bless our time in your word. Uh, give us insight into what you have to say to us during this time in life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grab a seat if you would. If you have a Bible, go to Revelation chapter 12. We're doing a verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Revelation. We're today in chapter 12. Very interesting chapter. And I want to start by just sharing a, a little story. A story is told about a man who owned a beautiful estate a large piece of property, and in the middle of it, along with a grove of beautiful trees, was a, a prize tree that was just huge. And he loved, it was part of his joy just to kind of walk through the grove and, and look at the trees, and, and he, he just took great pride in what he had. But he also had a neighbor who hated him and was always looking for a way to annoy him, a way to discourage him. And so he, he came up with a plan, the neighbor did, and he did this to kind of wound or discourage the heart of the, the owner of the property. One night, he decided to go out late at night and cut down one of the most beautiful trees that grew in the center of his property. And so he took a hand saw and an axe, and late at night he began to work. And he chopped and he sawed, and early in the morning as the sun was coming up, he, he saw the owner and someone else with him coming towards that area of the property. So he, 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 he worked harder and faster, and suddenly the tree began to creak, and it began to topple, and, and he began to scream a shout of victory that this tree had been cut down. And as the owner was coming and this individual with him, he, he was shouting this kind of victory over this tree, and it, one of the limbs, which was massive, caught him and pinned him to the ground. And the owner walked up, and obviously this, this man was... was was hurt very badly, and, and he, he said, what's going on? He, and he mocked him from the ground. He said, ah, look what I've done to your, to your precious tree. And he said, well, this individual with me is my architect. He's my builder, and we were just coming out here because this tree you cut down is the exact tree we're going to have to remove in order to build my house. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of like the cross, if you, if you pull back the curtain, so to speak, and you see the crowd that's motivated by the Pharisees and those who are envious of Jesus, and they are motivated, I believe, by the enemy, you, you hear the shouts from the crowd, crucify him, crucify him, before you hear the jeers and the, the loud voices saying, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. But, but if you pull the curtain back, and really look at the key players. They did exactly what God intended to be done. Send his son to a cross to die for you and I. There's more going on behind the scene than, than what we realize. And, and, and Revelation chapter 12, I believe, is, is, is a different look than we've seen so far. It's kind of like the, the curtain is pulled back and, and all the chaos and all the craziness and all the drama and all the action that's going on on earth during the tribulation. Well, we get to see the true forces that are work. We get to see the, those who are involved, the key players, if you will, in the whole drama. What's driving the world now? 
what has driven the world in the past and, and, and the unfolding of, of the future, those who are playing a key role and all the craziness that's going on around us. We, we, you know, we see the politicians, we, we, we see the military leaders, we, we see different things that are going on, but behind that, something else is going on. And Revelation chapter 12 begins to, to spell it out for us. It starts off now a great sign, or really the actual Greek word is wonder, a great wonder, and the word great means mega, so a mega wonder appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. So it's a, it's a mega wonder, and it's a woman. We, you could title chapter 12 Wonder Woman if you wanted to, because that's what it is. It's Wonder Woman. And Wonder Woman is, look, look what it says about her. Clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Being with child, she cried out in labor and, and pain to give birth. Another wonder appeared in heaven. Another sign, a great fiery red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So a, she bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Well, the first thing we see is this wonder woman, this, this sign giving birth, crying out in labor. And to identify this woman is a strong key, I believe, to really interpreting and unfolding the rest of the book of Revelation. Who is this woman? Who is this woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and garland of 12 stars, and being with child? Well, some say she's the church. But the church doesn't give birth to the male child who, who we find out and realize is Jesus Christ. Jesus gives birth to the church. You know how that works. On the day of Pentecost, after he rose from the dead, and then the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, and the, and the church was born. So, so the woman is not the church. And some say, well, the woman is Mary. She's the one who gave birth to the son. But, but look down at verse 6. The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,262 days. This never happened to Mary, the one who gave birth to Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I do believe that Mary, the Mary of Joseph and Mary, who we know in the Christmas story is highly favored among women, but not above women. She's a, she's a woman just like any other woman, although she was favored by God to give birth to the Messiah. But she never held any position of leadership in the church. In fact, you never hear a word about Mary after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. She's never mentioned again. That's the last time you hear about her. No leadership position in the church. She never appears again. And I think the proper interpretation of who is this woman would be the nation of Israel. In fact, when you see what's said here about her, the, the moon under her feet, the, the woman is clothed with the sun, and, and, and on her head are a garland of 12 stars. The only other place you see this imagery of the stars and the sun and the moon is when Joseph interpreted his dream to his brothers and shared it with him. You know, you know the story of Joseph. The, he was kind of the favored son of his aged father who kind of doted over Joseph, gave him that, that coat of many colors, which really was kind of like a, well, it was, it was a leisurely coat that you would wear around the house. It was a house coat because he didn't work out in the fields with his brothers. And his brothers hated him. His brothers were envious of him. And in, in Genesis chapter 37, I'll, I'll read it to you. He has a dream, and his brothers hated Joseph, and they, 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 they were envious of Joseph. And, and 
I don't think you should tell a dream like this to your brothers if they hate you. <laughs> Here's what he says. He told him the first dream, then he tells him another. He said, I, I dreamed another dream. And he told it to his brothers. He said, look, I've dreamed another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars, which would be his 11 brothers, bowed down to me. The sun and the moon, the sun would be his father, Jacob. The moon, his mother. The 11 brothers, including him, would make 12 stars. 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob being renamed Israel himself. And you've got this picture of this woman who gives birth to a Messiah, a son. The woman Israel gives birth to this male child there in Revelation. Go back to chapter 12 if you're still there. Listen to what it says about this, the birth of this child. There in chapter 12, if you read to verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. We know Jesus ascended to the throne of God after the crucifixion. And we know that he will one day rule the world with a rod of iron. In fact, in Psalm chapter 2, we have a prophecy of this. Ask of me, speaking, I believe, of Father to the Son, I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. When he comes on that great white horse, he'll rule and reign with a, with a rod of iron. This is the male child in verse 5. It tells us here, and this is an interesting passage of scripture. I believe you have Israel, and you have Satan, who is the dragon, and you have Jesus. And I, and I just want to stop right here for a second. Most of us know and believe in the nation of Israel. We know that it was rebirthed after being scattered for 2,000 years, a great prophetic sign of the end times. We also know Jesus. We believe in him. We read about him. But I think a lot of people kind of don't think much about Satan. But, he, but he's real. Jesus believed in him. In fact, Jesus talked about him a lot. And he believes in you. And he comes to tempt you and seduce you and deceive you. And here, here we have an interesting picture of this one called the dragon or Satan. It says in verse 3, another sign appeared in heaven, a great fiery red dragon, seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. And he, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. It looks like something out of a Japanese horror movie, doesn't it? Like a King Kong versus Godzilla with all the heads and the horns. And I, I think they're symbolic of some of the political powers that Satan will be a part of in the end times. Some of the, the I think, represent some of his wisdom and his strength. But where is the dragon? Look what it says. It says, he stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. From day one, the enemy had been out to stop the plan of the Lord. Yet he many times is a part of the fulfilling of that plan. There in the garden, he deceived Eve and was hoping for death, I believe, physically as well as spiritually. Adam and Eve were deceived. They ate of the fruit. I believe he motivated Cain to kill Abel. And if you study through the scriptures, here's what's uncanny to me. If, if you read, say, start in Genesis chapter 1 and just read to chapter 6, and six brief chapters there in the beginning of the time, you find that the enemy has so filled the world with violence and corruption and evil that by the very sixth chapter of Genesis, God has to destroy all mankind except for Noah and his family. That's insane. 
wait a minute, we're only in the sixth chapter of the book, of Bible, and, and God is destroyed. The enemy had so infiltrated the heart and the mind of man, they, they, they had nothing within their hearts except to do evil and violence. And God starts over. I believe he motivated and tempted Esau to kill Jacob. <coughs> Jacob, who was to have the 12 sons and, and, and who was to, to be the, the one who originated the tribes. He watches Abraham and Isaac, I think the enemy does, go up to the top of the mountain. And in his mind, he must be thinking, okay, this is it. Finally, he's going to stop the seed. But, but God provides a sacrifice for himself. We know that Pharaoh desired to wipe out the Jewish nation. and He had, was having all the firstborn Hebrew children drowned in the, the Nile River. There's this, there's, this, there's this vengeance and this attacking of this woman over and over again called Israel. Of course, God raised up Moses who delivered them with a powerful hand. By the time that, that Jesus himself is being born by Mary, Herod, you know, fearing that his throne might be in jeopardy, he, he sends his men to, to Bethlehem to slaughter all the children two years old and under because of the time that the Magi said that we saw the star. He calculated the time, and like a dragon, he had been waiting for this birth, and he sends out his cruel henchmen to do their bloody job. And it describes this, this, this Satan that says here in verse 3, he, he, he's, a, he's got a great fiery red dragon, seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on his head. This is not a, like a photo op for, for, for Satan, like this is what he really looks like. But it's a symbolic picture, a representation of his nature and his cruelty. He, he, his color is red, for his path has always been covered with blood. In fact, Jesus himself describes Satan. If, if you believe in him or not, Jesus does. And look what Jesus says about him in John chapter 8. Speaking to the Pharisees, he says, you're of the father, your father the devil. And then he describes him. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in truth. There's no truth in him. When he speaks, it's a lie. He speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. He's a murderer. This is how Jesus describes this dragon. He's a murderer and he's a liar. And so he's always been involved in murdering, always been involved in taking lives. When Satan saw the resurrection of Jesus, when he, when he saw that, oh my gosh, the, the, the tree I, I, I helped put him on, I thought that ended the plan. Well, if I fell right into the plan, now, now his blood has been shed and people can be cleansed. And when he saw the resurrection, you know what Satan did? He didn't, you know, collect eggs and go to church on Easter. He went after the church. He turned his cruelty toward the church. He had Christians tortured and imprisoned. He had them thrown into to lion's dens and, and arenas for the entertainment of politicians and kings and rulers. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, we have an actual description of, of what happens. He says, others had trials of mockings and scourgings. These are the early Christians of the first church. They had chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were, they were sawn in two. You can kind of catch the, the ferociousness of this dragon that's going after the Christians because of what's happened on the cross. They, they were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goat skins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. A dragon, a ruthless, cruel persecutor of God's people all the way from the time of the garden. And I believe, as we see even in the future here in Revelation chapter 12. He's also very deceptive. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, but even if our gospel is, is veiled, is hidden, is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds, and this is another name for the dragon, the God of this age, 
has blinded them who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So the curtain is pulled back here in Revelation chapter 12, and we see the spiritual warfare that's going on. It's not just Israel and different nations. There's a real enemy called Satan, this dragon, and there's a, there's a real God, and his son is being involved, and Israel's involved, and there's this spiritual warfare that's going on, like it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. If you look there in chapter 12, when, when this fiery red dragon, seven heads and ten horns, verse 3, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman. And many believe this represents the fact when, when Satan himself fell, that he took with him a third of the angels in heaven, a third of the stars. But Israel, playing a part in this end times, it tells us the woman fled, we read this verse a minute ago in verse 6, into a wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Three and a half years. It's that time of tribulation. It's the second half of Daniel's 70th week, if you know that passage at the end of Daniel chapter 9. So, so, so God takes this remnant of Israel that believes and he and he. he prepares a place and he sends them. Some, some say it's the city of Petra, which is just across the Israel border into Jordan. If you ever get a chance to go there, it's an amazing place. I've only been to, to, to Petra once, but it's, it's over in, in Jordan and it's this rock city hewn out of, out, of, out of solid rock. And you have to travel through these deep ravines to get there. It's a, it's a place that could be easily protected and fortified. Long winding roads. Some say Petra's where they'll flee to. Some say Edom. Wherever they go, wherever Israel goes and is sheltered by the Lord. I want you to look at verse 6 because there's some interesting wording there. It says in verse 6 of chapter 12 of Revelation, Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place. And here's the, the three words I want you to see. Prepared by God. A place prepared by God. God's grace and his mercy, like a loving father in the midst of this tribulation, in the midst of all that's going on as, as the, the, the dragon is attacking, if you will, he gives a place of safety and security for his people. He gives a place that's prepared by him. Did you know that that wording is only used one other time in all the Bible where God prepares a place? And it's in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. It says, when Jesus was ascending before he went into heaven, if, and if I go and prepare a place, there's this, that's the only other time it's used, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. God prepares a place for those who know him, who love him, and have been purchased by him. So the question that rises to my mind out of that is, do you know for sure that God's prepared a place for you if you were to die? Do you know that, that if you were to die, you would go to that place that God has prepared for you? He's got a place prepared for those who trust him during the time of tribulation, and he has a place prepared for those who die before the tribulation, all those who know him. Look at verse 7 as we, as we go through this chapter. It, it says, and, and war broke out in heaven. Let, I'll stop right there. War breaks out in heaven? I thought heaven was all like harps and angels and hanging out as peaceful. No, there's war going on. There's war going on in heaven. Michael, with his angels, fought with the dragon, who also was an angel at one time. 
He took a third of the stars with him, a third of the stars. Many times angels are described as stars. So we're going to call this from seven on Star Wars. That's what's happening here. <laughs> we got Star Wars. We got Wonder Woman. How more relevant can the Bible be? So here they are. There's a, there's, a, there's a star war in heaven. Michael, his angels, fraught with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought. They did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Now I want to stop right there. Verse 8. What, what do you mean? You mean the devil and his angels have access to heaven? Yeah. A lot of people kind of, kind of have this picture, you know, that Satan's down in hell. He's got a pitchfork tail and a little pitchfork, and he's got the horns, and he's walking around, and he's kind of trapped. And people come and he pokes them. No, he, he's not in hell right now. In chapter 12 is a future picture of the, the curtain pulled back. He still has access to heaven. He still accuses believers. But here in chapter 12, he's finally thrown out. And there's this war going on, and Michael's involved with it. It's an interesting passage of Scripture. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, you know the, the, the story in Job where he would come before the Lord and accuse people. He said, where you been? I've been going to and fro. You know, he said, why have you considered my servant Job? And he begins to accuse him. Well, you, you know, you put a hedge around him. I can't touch him. If you remove it, he'll curse you. So the enemy, apparently, uh, he, up to the time of tribulation, still has access to heaven in some way. And this war happens, and the woman was given, it says, uh, birth to the child. He tries to, you know, kill the child, but he's cast out of heaven. Angels with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused him before our God day and night has been cast down. Now, I want to say this. All the different crowns and the different things that describe this red dragon, I, I believe they have to do with some of his characteristics, some of his abilities. But Satan is not all-powerful. His power is limited. God is all-powerful, and his plan will be accomplished. The enemy is not all-knowing. God is all-knowing. The enemy is not all-present. God is all-present everywhere. Satan has none of those qualities. So now we have these angels in battle. Two angels fighting against one another. This is interesting to me because at one time they served side by side, Michael and Lucifer. They were on the same team. It's like what happened in our Civil War. Maybe you know that story. General Grant, who led the Union Army. Robert E. Lee, who led the Confederate Army. They both attended West Point Academy together at one time. And, and they both fought side by side in the Mexican-American War. But during the Civil War, they're, they're opposed to one another. They're, they're enemies of one another. And here's what we find in, in Revelation chapter 12, two angels who weren't served side by side, now in opposition with one another. And Satan seems to have access to heaven. This is in the future and the way the wording is here, the way the wording is here in the Greek, it, it seems as if it was the dragon who prompts the battle with Michael. It's a violent outburst of rage. It's, it's, it's this attack by Lucifer. But he says, Rejoice, O heaven, and you who dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. So, so stay with me. He's cast to the earth during this time of tribulation, and he knows he has a short time, and he wants to wreak havoc, violent outburst of rage. He knows his end is near and that Jesus is returning. It's kind of kind of like he knows he's about to be cast into eternal damnation. I don't know if you've ever 
been standing around like a, a pool or something and someone's trying to throw you in? What's your first reaction? You're going with me, sucker, if I'm going in that pool. Like someone tries to throw you in, you grab them, right? No, -uh, you're coming with me. And that's kind of the mindset here. He knows he's about to be cast, and he's after everyone and anyone that he can take with him. He attacks. His primary way is, is through temptation, how he attacks us. So I stop here for a second, and I ask the question, any of you ever been tempted? A couple of people, sure. The rest of you are immune to temptation, right? The enemy comes and he, he tempts you with something, a thought, an action. He, he preys on, on, on a weakness in your life. And he sets something in your mind. And, 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 he, and he tries to, to drag you into some kind of lifestyle or some kind of response. His primary way is temptation and the mind. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. He's got some devices. Temptation, planting thoughts in our mind, leading us up to something. And then when you give in, when you sin, when you stumble, when you fall, not that I've ever done that. I'm very holy. <laughs> Don't talk to my wife. But we all stumble, right? We all fall. I, I, I bet that every one of us in this room had done something this week that we knew was wrong or that we stumbled into or we lost our temper or whatever it might be. And as soon as that happens, Another device of the enemy is to begin to accuse you. You hypocrite. You call yourself a pastor. You had that thought. You, you, did, you, you said that. You, you got that angry. You fall. You, you slip. And, and he, he accuses you. I mean, in, in Revelation chapter 12, he, he, he's this dragon, and, 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 he, and he'll tell you, you're not worthy to serve the Lord. This is a battle that, that the enemy fights with your mind all through your life, accusing you, slandering you. When you fall, when, you, when, when, you're, when you're weak, he, 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 he attacks. And well, what he wants, if he can't get you to not know the Lord, he'll certainly try to diffuse you into a place where you feel unworthy to serve the Lord or to represent the Lord. And we're given away a, a, a three-part process here of fighting that in this passage. It says, they overcame him, verse 11. By the blood of the Lamb, number one, by the word of their testimony, verse 2, verse 11, and they did not love their lives to death. So the enemy comes and accuses you. And, and you know what? Sometimes, well, most of the time, what he accuses you of is true. And we agree with him. Yeah, you're right. I had that thought. Yeah, you're right. I did that. Yeah, I, I blew up. Yeah, I should have never said that. No, I should have never done that. Yeah, you're right. I promised the Lord I'd do this, and I, and I never did it. And, oh, you're weak. You're, and and, and there, there's no way that, that, you know, it's like this mental battle that goes on. And, but he says you can overcome it by the blood of Jesus Christ. So instead of fighting, you just say, you know what? You're right. I am weak. Yeah, yeah, I failed. Yeah, I blew it. But you know what? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. I fight that battle not in my own strength or my own goodness. Well, no, well, I, I, I have done this. Remember when I did that? No, no, no. We overcome him by the blood of Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 1, we, we have this great verse. This is the message which you've heard from him and declared to you that God is light. There's no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, well, we lie and do not practice the truth. It goes on. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, anybody out there say that? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. How? By the blood of Jesus Christ. How do we come against the accusations and the attacks and the mental game with the, 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 the dragon? Well, number one, I would say that our only real hope is by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not in my works, not my righteousness, lest any man should boast, but only in his grace and his blood. That's why we do communion. That's why we take that wafer. Remember that there was a, a sacrifice given for me and that juice that the body and the blood represent the fact that I can be changed and transformed into a new person. So when the enemy comes, you say, look, I don't have any defense except for the blood of Jesus Christ. Not only that, but also by the word of their testimony, you identify who you belong to. Look, I'm not my own. I, I belong to Jesus Christ. And you, you kind of make a, a line in the sand with your life and you make a decision. Okay, who am I going to serve and who do I belong to? Do I belong to the Lord? Do I belong to myself or do I belong to the enemy? You know, I have a small group in my home right now. It's about 22 people. We're going through a, a, a study together called um, Sacred Marriage. What is marriage all about? So there's 20-something people. They've all been married for quite a time. And some of them only for not even a year. And up to Lynn and I, we've been married since the dinosaur age. So there's that. <laughs> And I, at the very beginning, it was kind of get to know each other. So we said, okay, just go around the room. Tell us who you are. How many children do you have? How long you've been married? Well, everybody, you know, said, well, I've, there wasn't a single person who was unwilling to identify their marriage partner. They all, they all kind of had these, these rings on. You know, none of them said, well, I'm not really married. Not to him anyway. I mean, they may have felt that way, but you identify whose you are. You know, th th this is my wife, Lynn. We've been married for X amount of years. We've got three kids. We might not be married next year, but we're married right now because you never know. No, I'm just kidding. Well, not really. No, kind of am. <laughs> <laughs> Marriage is an interesting thing, isn't it? <laughs> But I identify with it. I identify that I have a wife, you know, and, and, and I'm hers and she's mine. And there's this identification you need to make with who do you belong to, not in your own heart, but even publicly. It releases you from a lot of things. Your friends should know. Your coworkers should know. Your neighbors should know. The enemy should know that you belong. There's no such thing as a closet Christian. You come out of the closet and you say, you know what? Hey, I, now I belong to Jesus. I've, I've left my old life behind. And, 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 and you need to do it for his sake as well. He needs to know, do you, are you following me or not? Are you mine? So, so by the, the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And then it even says this. Interesting verse. And they did not love their lives to death. In other words, Lord, whatever, whatever I have to face, I'm yours. Because here's the thing. If the Lord doesn't come back in, in, in my time or your time, guess what? We're all going to die. I've done a lot of funerals in the 40 years that I've been here. I walked through that cemetery over there and in Gulf Breeze, and I'm just amazed. Like, wow, gee, there's my brother, there's my mother, there's one of my friends, there's, oh my gosh. And, and, and one of the interesting ones that's there is my stepdad. Not my stepdad, my father-in-law. My stepdad's over there, too. But I'll never forget when my father-in-law moved here from Baltimore, Maryland. He was a marketing executive for, for milk all over the Northeast, and he marketed milk with a lot of uh, companies. He got milk. He, he had that slogan. He, he, he did commercials with the Phillies and the Orioles, and we used to go to these little... Uh, we go to the baseball game with the Orioles and the Phillies, and we got, to, we got this cool parking place right up front. We got to go in these little group sessions before with all the players and got to shake their hands and say hi. We felt like, yeah, yeah, we know somebody. 
But he came here, and his, his, his whole goal was to retire, and he retired right before he was 70 years old, and he was going to live out his life here in Florida. He was an aviation buff. He loved the, the you know, the, the Naval Air Station. He loved flying remote control airplanes. But he got congestive heart failure. And uh, he went down really fast, had heart surgery. And I'll never forget what happened. My wife, who's the oldest of four daughters, and then her brother, who's the oldest of the siblings, were all called to his house. He built a beautiful house over in Scenic Hills near the golf course. And he, he, he had decided that he was not going to do dialysis anymore. He was not going to take all these meds. He was, he was finished with it, that he was just going to go and go to heaven. So he called us all to his house, all his children and all their spouses. And there we were sitting in his, in his living room. And he had one of those chairs that, I don't know if you've ever seen one that helps lift you up so you can stand up. Have you ever seen that? You, you will. You'll see it one day. <laughs> <laughs> so he had one of those chairs. And so here's what he did. He said, I, I asked John, he pointed to me, to find me a, a plot over in uh, Gulf Breeze under an oak tree. He said, John found one. And there's, there's four next to it. Who's in? <laughs> nobody, nobody raised their hands that I'm in. But I said, oh, let's move on. And he said, I, I, I'm not going to do dialysis anymore. I'm not going to take any more medications. I'm not going to live my life in and out of the hospital anymore. He said, I made this decision with my wife. And I wanted to get you all here tonight. And he said, I have something I want to say to every one of you. And then I want every one of you to say something to me. So he went around the room to each of his children, to each of their spouses. And then when he finished, he said, now I want each of you to say something to me. There wasn't a dry eye in the place. I can guarantee you that. And when it was all over, he, he got up out of his chair he said, now I'm going to bed. He said, I got one last thing to say. He said, I'm going to heaven, and I expect to see every one of you there. <laughs> and three days later, he died in that house. And he had paid off his house. He had bought his wife a new car. He had said everything he needed to say. And he went to heaven, and that's a tough act to follow but he knew who he belonged to. And he wasn't afraid. See, see, there's something wonderful about knowing that the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all my sins. There, there's something powerful about saying, you know, I identify with him and I'm not ashamed of him. I belong to him. And, and then there's this, this, this amazing thing of knowing that, you know, my life is not my own. It belongs to him no matter what comes my way. And I walk that out, not just, not just verbally, but in the way I live, the way I, the things I own and how I treat those things that come into my life, you know, knowing that they're, they're really not my, he didn't take anything with him, but our hearts. And so we have, this, we have this enemy, we have this picture in, in Revelation chapter 12 of not only the dragon, but how to, to fight against the dragon and all his devices. And, and it tells us as we close out the chapter, now when the dragon saw, verse 3, that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. He came after Israel, and, and I think not only Israel, but all those who have been born by the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ, into the church who were here during the time of tribulation. He came after them. But the woman was given two wings of great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times a half from the presence of the serpent. She's taken to the place that God has prepared, Israel has. So the serpent spewed out water from his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. And people, you know, ask, well, what is, what is this water here in verse 15? Some say it's an actual flood, some kind of traumatic, climatic flood that comes on the face of the earth. Others say, no, it's, it's just symbolic of the outpouring of hate and anti-Semitism and all the things that he brings against Israel. We, we don't really know. But the earth helped the woman 
The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's, he's not too happy. The serpent's not happy. And he doesn't have a good day. And he's, he's out to deceive. And, and thank God there, there is a, a, a way that's been given to us in Scripture to combat his devices. And there is a way to know for sure that I have a place prepared for me. And there's a wonderful ability to identify with him and to come to a place where you realize, you know what? I don't really own anything except for my heart that I've given to Christ. The rest belongs to him. And I, I, I want to challenge you, I want to challenge myself, I want to challenge us as a body of believers that in the time that we live in, I think we're beginning to see the curtain kind of pulled back. It's not all about the politicians and elections. It's not all about, you know, wars and rumors of wars. It's about this, this war that's going on in the heavenly, so to speak, with this dragon and with the Lord Jesus Christ and those who are following him. And we're in, I think we're in the midst of it. And the earth has been shaken in so many different ways, and there's so much going on. And, and I think we're, we're close to a time where we could say, you know, lift up your head, for our redemption draws nigh. Amen? Amen. Let's stand again.